at, we're going to look at um, finishing this up. And there's a couple of things I wanted to do. I wanted to revisit the constructors, especially of the order uh, object or our order class, because I don't think we did anything with the constructor of that at all. Um, we might revisit the pizza classes constructors too, just for good measure. Um, I think there was one other function I wanted to have on the order class, and that is determine the bake time, which would be the. We're assuming that there, you know, that there's not a restriction to the space of the oven that you could start them all at the same time, and in which case uh, the bake time would be the maximum of the pizza's bake time. So I want to get those constructors and that function done. I want to talk about testing this. What it would take to test this? What would it take to test this thoroughly? What are a couple of the approaches that there are to testing? There's actually a couple of different kinds of approaches to testing, and, and we'll, look at, uh, we'll look at them. Then I want to have uh, an opportunity for you to, uh, I do this periodically, I think some other teachers do this too, where I ask you, what is one thing about the class that you're confident about? Uh, and that can be anything. You can be confident in the day of the week that it runs, all right, the room that it's in. Maybe that's what you're confident in. Maybe you're confident about how to do mathematical instructions, how to declare integers and add two integers and things like that. Maybe you're comfortable about um, what a class is. Maybe you're comfortable about what an object is. So it doesn't matter how big or small it is, but I want you to pick one thing that you're comfortable with. I also want to, you to pick one thing that you're uncomfortable with, one thing that you, um, in your mind, just isn't completely clear. And we'll spend some time trying to go over those. Um, and, and, and that should be class. If we, if, we, if we run out of time doing those three things, I don't know what I'm going to do. I guess I'll figure something out. All right. So starting with uh, the class, the first thing I want to do is I want to add to the order class a function to loop through, or, or to get the, 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 the bake time for the, um, for the uh, order. Defining the bake time as the bake time of the, the, long, the, long, the greatest bake time of any of the pizzas. All right, it's good to think about this. Because the one thing that I collectively see that there is a little bit of confusion about is functions. So we're going to make a function, right? Where is that function going to live? In what class? Where is the, where is the function to determine how long it will take to prepare an order be? It will be in which class? Be in the order class, all right? Um, there already should be something in the pizza class that tells us how long it takes to make each individual pizza, which there is. But what we want to do is we want, we want that for the whole order. And it, it almost is giving it away to say, where will the function be to calculate the preparation time or the bake time for the order? Well, if it's something about the order, it ought to be in the order class, right? So, Almost the way that, that it's asked should have given away the answer that it's going to live in the order class. Um, are we going to make this public or private? Public. Why are we going to make it public? So other classes can access it. So other can access it. Um, for this kind of function, it doesn't do us any good to have a private function because inside the order class, the calculation would be able to be performed, but outside of it, no one would be able to ask the order how long would it take to bake. And that doesn't really make sense for this kind of function. As a general rule, if you don't have any idea of what to do, if you're clueless, make your attributes private and your functions public, and you'll be right 80% of the time, 90% of the time, 95, maybe 100% of the time for this class. Make attributes private, functions public. Again, we make attributes private so that no other classes can manipulate them directly. They have to go through the methods. 
And by going through the methods, then we have control over how an attribute is set. So later on, we're not doing it right at this point, but later on we can write code that says, hey, wait a minute, you can't set the, 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 the size of the pizza to humongous, all right? There's only three possibilities, large, medium, and small, all right? So it has to be one of those things. So we can actually write code that will prohibit certain things from happening. If the other classes could access those attributes directly, those other classes could do anything they wanted to with those. So because of that, we make attributes private. We make functions public because typically classes outside of the class are going to want to ask that um, are going to want to ask that um, question of, of how long does it take the pizza to bake? How long um, you know is um, you know how long um, how much is the cost of the order and, and things like that? Okay. What should the return value of this function be? Pardon me? What, yeah, what data type? A double. Double would be good. Why a double? Yeah, because this, this answer isn't a string. Right? Um, it isn't a Boolean, true or false. It isn't anything else. It's a number. How long? How many minutes is it going to take for this debate? Look. Now, I've, I've seen people do things like this, all right? And they think it's a good idea to have it return a string and make the string something like 17 minutes, all right? I've seen people think that that's a good idea. Why is that not a good idea? Yes. Yeah, in case you need to do some math with the result, all right? Um, you would, you want to return as a number. Now, I can see where they're getting at. Maybe on the receipt that we print for the person that places the order, your order will be ready in 17 minutes. That's a formatting issue of the output. So, yeah, we might format it before we output it, but we're going to return it as a function. So the function that says calculate the bake time ought to return a number. Um, and uh, if we need to format it, um, then we can, we can easily do that. So it's going to return a double. The name of the function doesn't really matter, right? But what should it start with? What should the name of the function start with? What's a better function name? Calculate bake time or calculate bake time? Second one. Yeah, the function name should start as lowercase. Uh, typically, the only thing that I can think of off the top of my head that is going to start with uppercases are the names of classes. All right, names of classes are start with uppercase. Later on, we'll study interfaces, and interfaces also start. Interfaces are sort of like classes, all right? Okay, so what's the last thing we have to determine for any function? Are there going to be any arguments? Are there going to be any arguments on this one? No. Why not? Why don't we need the arguments? Why don't we need some arguments on this? We need to know what pizzas are on the order, right? But we don't need them pass as arguments. Why is that? Be real careful when I ask a question like this when no one's answering. Be careful not to move at all. Or I will think that you're raising your hand and call on you. I've also heard 
that you can tell how experienced a teacher is by how long they're willing to wait to get an answer. That the less experienced teachers will ask a question and go like maybe 10 seconds and get nervous and then will answer it themselves. And the more experienced teachers will wait until they get an answer. Oh, I don't have it with me. I was going to show a picture of me getting my 15 year service award here at Learning Community. So I should tell you how long. Yes? Is it because we're using pizza objects? Is it we're using pizza objects? You're on the right track. Where are the pizza objects that comprise this order? Well, well, yeah, there's a pizza class, but, well, we created them in the unit test. We put them in the array list, exactly. I, I think all these things taken together kind of give us the right answer. We don't, we, yes, we need the pizzas, but the pizzas are already there in that class. Why? Because we have, in this class, an attribute of the array list of pizzas that belong to this order. So that's already an attribute of the order class. We've already gone and added those pizzas to the array list. Right, we create, them in the, we create those pizza objects in the unit test. And yes, they're pizza classes, or pizza objects, made from the pizza class, and they get added to this array list. So this array list, this attribute, is a characteristic of the pizza. So this object down here, or I'm sorry, this function down here, to calculate the cost, didn't need any arguments. Why? Because all it is going to do is it's going to loop through a list of all the pizzas. The list of all the pieces already live as part of the order, so we don't have to give this function anything new. So to answer the question, no, there's no arguments. When you're thinking of writing a function, first thing to do would be something like that. All right? That'd be the first thing to do would be something like that. Make sure you understand the inputs and what you're going to send out. Um, Keeping in mind that if you need something that's already in that class as an attribute, you don't need to pass it into that function again. So we don't need to give it pizzas again. We already have the pizzas in the order object. Now, one thing that I've heard people say is that uh, one guy I worked with who was a really, he might, he might have been the best programmer I ever worked with, although I would never tell that to him to his face. <laughs> Uh, is one thing that you can do that's a good idea is write your comments in before you write the code in. So, we can almost write the comments in before we write the code. And that's good. That's good for two reasons. One reason is it helps us to figure out what we need to do. So, on, you know, before we actually sit down and write the Java code, we think through the steps to do it. I've seen people, and again, I'm not faulting because, you know, people are still learning programming in this class and other classes I teach. But I've seen people that like do things like in like a backwards order. They, they'll, they'll, they'll calculate the gross pay and then they'll go get the hours from the form, for example. I've seen like in my JavaScript classes. All right. Well, you can't do two, you can't calculate the gross pay until you get the hours from the form. So that has to go before that. So it's good to think through what you have to do. All right. So if I was going to write comments for this, we know basically what the formula is. Is we want to pick the maximum, we want to pick the maximum bake time of all the pizzas. The pizza has in it a function that says calculate bake time that returns the bake time for this pizza. All right? 
So we know that that has it. What we want to do is we want to pick the maximum of these. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to initialize the result at zero. Why am I initializing the result at zero? Yeah, we, we, we have to, any variables that we have, we have to initialize, right? Um, is there a pizza that will not take more than zero minutes to bake? No. So I know if they have any pizza in their order, it's going to be greater than this. So it's going to give me, regardless of what the pizza is, it's going to give me that as the bake time. Lastly, this is almost like a philosophy question. How long does it take to prepare an order for pizzas for which there are no pizzas? How long does it take to bake an order if that order is for no pizzas? Zero minutes, right? So if nothing else is great, if it happens not to have any pizzas in this order, it's going to come up with, well, it takes zero minutes, right? Which is, which is accurate. It's not like a lie, all right? So therefore, I'm going to initialize my result for zero. If I have to figure out I'm going to call this the maximum, because that's what the result is. I'm going to loop through all the pizzas in the order. I'm going to indent a little bit because this is part of the loop. All right. If this pizza's bake time is greater than the max, it becomes You'll learn eventually, if you haven't already, that I am the world's worst keyboarder. So if this pizza's bake time is greater than the maximum, then this pizza is the new maximum. So when am I done? I'm done after I've looked at every pizza, and I've looked to see if it is greater than the maximum. So if the first pizza had a maximum of, uh, or had a bake time of 10, and the second one had a, a bake time of 16, well, we'd run through the first time through the loop, well, the maximum is 10. The second time through the loop, well, 16 is greater than, so the, max, the bake time is 16. The pieces were stored in the, uh, the other way around. We would loop through, and um, we would, uh, 16 would be the maximum, and then 10 is not greater than 16, so we wouldn't change the maximum. Finally, when we're all done, we need to return the result. It's really good if you can do this because now all you have to do is translate into Java statements. A lot of times this, believe it or not, this is the hardest thing to do, all right, is to think through the steps you need to accomplish the task. Once you've thought through the steps of how you're going to accomplish the task, writing the Java statements actually isn't that hard, at least not in many cases. Now again, there are exceptions, you know, and so on and, and all that, but it's been my experience that figuring out what you want to do is typically, at least for bigger problems, harder than uh, writing the actual code. All right, so how do we initialize the result to zero? What's that statement going to look like? Double max bake time.
equals zero. Real straightforward. How do we loop through all the pizzas? Well, guess what? We saw how to do that up here. I'm going to copy this here. I guess I could put an extra comment on here that says get next pizza or look at next pizza. So we get the pizza object. If this pizza's bake time is greater than max, then this pizza is a new max. So what's this going to look like? Pardon me? Yep, calculate bake time. No arguments. Then what? Okay, looks good. What if it's not less than that? What if what it would is there an else part to this? Yeah, we don't really need a statement there, right? Because if the new bake time isn't greater than the old bake, uh, old maximum, then we just don't really need to do anything. So we don't even need an else on this. The previous bake time it retains the championship as the maximum bake time, so we don't need to, to switch anything. Finally, when we're done. Return result, it's going to look like what? Return max bake time. Now, I had some people, uh, I, I just, you know, I periodically get questions, not just this semester, but other semesters. And it's a little confusing until you um, really understand the meaning of different things. All right? So let's look at a few things and why they are the way they are. All right? First of all, Max bake time doesn't have parentheses after it. All right? That, that's confusing to some people. Whereas calculate bake time does have parentheses after it. What's the difference between those two? One's a variable, one's a function. The one, if it's declared as a variable like this, then you just use the name of the variable. This, however, is a function that exists on the pizza class, and therefore we need the parentheses. Remember, even if your function doesn't take arguments, you still have to put the parentheses there to indicate there are no arguments. All right? Otherwise, the Java compiler is going to think that you're talking about a variable. All right? Can I get rid of? I actually don't think so. This bracket on 50 belongs to the order up here. And this isn't a small thing. I actually should, to clarify that, I should indent all this. Oh, you're right. Thank you. All right. And I did indent them. All right. So, yeah, you're right. Thank you. I had see, saw, see, saw the one and thought it was the one for the end of the class. I didn't realize there was more up below. Good, good eye. Okay, why is, why is there parentheses after pizza's dot size? It's a function, array list, right. What is pizza's? Pizza's is an object of what type? Of type array list that's going to hold pizza's and so on. 
Why do we say P calculate bake time? Because we're looking at each pizza in turn. We're looping through for as many pizzas we have, that is as many elements are in that array list, for each one, for each value of I, I is going to go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to as many values are in I, we are going to call, uh, get that pizza. So the first time through the loop we get the pizza in position 0. The second time we get the pizza in position 1, 2, and so on. So I'm simply grabbing a, a pointer to that. I actually, and I don't want to confuse anyone, I actually, an alternate way of coding this would be, instead of saying p dot calculate bake time, I could say And you can sort of chain those instructions together. This instruction returns a pizza, the pizza that gets returned here I'm calculating the bake time for. So this would be the equivalent of this line up here. Likewise, I could redo the if statement if I wanted to. If you have no idea what I meant there, just ignore that. Just learn it. This, in my mind, is the more straightforward way to do it. So I oftentimes do things what I consider the more straightforward way. Um, I think that's a little bit of difference between me and other, and other people who I've seen coding, is that I don't think always um, taking little shortcuts that uh, allow for like fewer lines of code are always a good idea. If we did this, for example, we could get rid of this line of code. All right, but is getting rid of that line of code worth the fact that I might sit there and have to think about, gee, what does pizzas? Calculate, get one. I don't know. All right. I guess it depends, and it's not right or wrong. It's just my style to possibly break things down to simple steps instead of having one gigantic, complicated step. I guess that's sort of the approach I take. So let's go and let's see if this is right. All right. So I'm going to go and open up our unit test. I'm going to put in here some dash lines just to separate the output. Okay, so what am I doing here? Most of this is review from last time, but we can take a look. I create a pizza using the constructor that takes two arguments. Remember, there's two arguments. Uh, there, there's two constructors, if I remember right, um, on a pizza. There is an argument that accepts. Actually, there's three constructors. There's one that accepts three arguments, a size, a string, and a boolean saying whether it's pepperoni or not. There's one that accepts a size and an argument that says if it has bool uh, a boolean or not. And the assumption is if no crust is supplied, then it's a thin crust pizza. And then finally, there is uh, a no constructor argument Whereas, if they don't say anything about uh, any of the properties, it assumes that you want a medium thin crust pepperoni. Maybe that's the company special, you know. Maybe, you know, you know, what do you have for lunch? I have a pizza. Boom, that's what you get, you know, because that's defined as the special. 
So you could argue about the practicality of these, but I want to make sure we understand these on a technical level. So it has three. Notice what these constructors do. They set these properties. All right? String, string, boolean. First one argument gets put in size, the second one gets put in crust, the third gets put in pepperoni. How many constructors can I have? Well, pretty much as many as you want. What is a restriction on constructors, though? There is a, there is a restriction on constructors, so you're limited in one respect. You're on the right direction. The data type of what? The data type of the arguments. It cannot have a duplicate set of arguments. So, for example, I have this that accepts two arguments. I couldn't do this. and try to write a second function that accepted that accepted a string and a boolean as arguments. Can you see why I couldn't do that? The compiler will have no way which of those two constructors you want to call if you call a function with a string and a boolean. All right? If the constructors have different sets of arguments, then the compiler can easily figure out which one you want. Oh, you want the argument that has two strings and a boolean. You want the uh, uh, constructor that has no uh, um, arguments. You want the constructor that has a string and a boolean as an argument. So therefore, you cannot have two constructors that have the same exact same set of arguments based on their data type. So I couldn't try to do that. It would give me an error. Likewise, I couldn't have two constructors that accepted no arguments, right? Because if I use that, how's the compiler going to know which is which? Now the compiler knows which constructor you're calling based on what arguments you give it. And if you were to give it arguments that didn't match one of the constructors, for example, if I, if I got the order wrong and passed a boolean, a string, and a string, the compiler would give me an error because it doesn't see a constructor that has arguments of boolean, string, and string. It sees one that, one that has arguments of string, string, and boolean, but no boolean, string, string. Okay, so I have these three constructors. Remember the purpose of the constructor is to set the attributes of the object, set the characteristics of it, at the same time you're creating it. All right, so it's sort of just a way of, of combining a couple of steps. In our first examples, we created it with no arguments, so we didn't set any of the properties, and then called a bunch of set statements, set functions to set the properties. This allows us to do everything all in one step. In fact, actually a better way to do this, instead of saying size equals arg size, is to actually call the set size method. If I don't give the name for a function, it assumes it's in this object. So if I just say set size and I don't have like anything before it, it will assume it's in this object. I can also do this, and that means the same thing.
why do you think it's better to use the set methods instead of directly setting the attributes? Any guesses? I don't expect you necessarily to know, but there's any validation code. Later on, we're going to do things like we're going to validate these things. Like, for example, um, the size, the kind of crust, all those things probably can only have specified values. Later on, if we did something like for, um, uh, you know, did a payroll application and had the number of hours someone worked, well, they can't work a negative number of hours, right? Um, therefore, we might have in our set function code to validate and make sure that the, that the integer coming in is uh, a positive number. And if it wasn't, then we'll throw an exception. We'll talk about exception processing later on. So it's kind of a good habit to get into to call the set functions. So even if you have a constructor, you're still going to have those set functions, right, for this purpose. And also, you might give the person the ability uh, or a class may need to change after it's created. I may, you know, thinking of a, a silly example, I may uh, call in to make my order and say, I'll have that with of a large, of a medium thin crust with pepperoni. Oh, wait a minute, never mind, I'm really hungry. Can you make that a large instead? All right, well then, you could go and you would, the, the, U, the UI would call the set function to change the value of the object as opposed to deleting the, or uh, yeah, getting rid of the object and creating a new brand new object. All right. So what constructor, oh, we're not worried about constructors yet. So these are calling the appropriate constructors. Again, this one, I have two constructors. So I'm going to call the one that accepts the size and has pepperoni and default that one to false. This one is creating one with no arguments, so it will default all of them, all of them. and it's going to show me for each of them the bake time and the cost. I then go and create my order. I add those three pizzas to my order. I then ask for the bake time and pizza, uh, bake time and cost for the order. Now, one thing that can be confusing too, I notice this in all my programming classes, is that people get confused between what you put in quotes and what you don't put in quotes. Okay? Typically, what you put in quotes are what are called string literals. String literals are like hard coded string values. Not variable names, not functions, not anything else. So, for example, I want to print out literally exactly these characters. Bake time for pizza one. There's not a variable called bake time. There's not a, this isn't like a number or a date or anything like that. I want to print out literally those exact characters. Just like here. I want to call this function and I have to put that in quotes because if I didn't, it's going to expect a variable named L. And there is no variable named L. I want to set this to a string that simply contains an L. All right? So therefore, I'll go and do that. Other things that are not string literals are what? Objects, no quotes around objects. Functions, no quotes around functions. Other data types, for example, a Boolean, no quotes around those. Numbers, no quotes around those. All right. So really, the only thing you put quotes around are string literals. When you don't have a variable or a function or anything, but you want those exact letters to be used either in printing out or assigning to a variable or something like that. All right, let's test this and see if it works. I'm going to remember first try how to get to the command prompt today instead of staring at the screen for five minutes. All right, 
cd desktop slash monday i believe it's called pizza To my directory listing, there's all my stuff. Java C, star.java. Compiled cleanly. Java unit test. All right, bake time for pizza one is 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. All right. So, therefore, the bake time for the whole order is 10 minutes. It's assuming you can start them all at the same time and that the oven can hold them. All right? So it did pick the maximum. Is this a good test for this? No. <laughs> Excellent. Why not? Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, this gave good results. It worked in this case, but it's not really a good test case. I would not like. I would not get ready to throw the confetti and raise the banners and all that quite yet. All right, because again, we haven't tested this thoroughly enough. It works if all three of them happen to have the same bake time. Maybe the maybe the calculate uh, order bake time is simply returning ten every single time, and it's just a coincidence that it worked. Therefore, I'm going to need to test this more thoroughly. So one way I could test this is by giving and looking in the function to calculate the pizza's bake time, and I see, ah, the problem is, is that I need a thick crust pizza, right? Because th all thin crust pizzas only take 10 minutes to bake. All thick crust pizzas take 16 minutes to bake. This, by the way, is known as white box testing. I don't like the term white box and black box. It should be transparent box and opaque box. Is that the right word? Because the idea of white box testing is that your code is transparent. You're going to test with knowledge of how your code works. All right? Because that allows you to do that allows you to take some shortcuts, and that allows you to do a better job testing. In a case like this, I can say, well, I better make sure that my test case includes at least one thick pizza, one thick crust pizza. So I'll go in here, and I'll create a pizza that is thick crust. using the three argument constructor of that. All right? So now I'll go and test it. Tells you the bake time for order is 16. So I'm feeling happier. Right? But am I ready to throw the confetti yet? What if there was a bug in this that it gave, it considered the first pizza was always considered the maximum? There was a bug in my code that I didn't know. I might move that pizza around in the order, all right, of, uh, in, in the order. So I might put it as my first pizza. I might put it as my last pizza, just to make sure that it doesn't matter how the order is. Because again, if I had a bug in there, it's possible that it's just telling me the, the bake time of the first order. Now again, we can look at the code. We know that that's not what it's doing. But if you're testing something more extensive, that could be a possibility. So I'm going to test this. And it gave me the right results. So now, yeah, maybe, maybe we'll get some confetti flying. All right? We could still do some testing. 
I would want to test the order with zero pizzas. Why? Just so it doesn't give me some ridiculous number that is going to have an impact elsewhere on, on my system. How could I do that? Well, I could comment these out. At the very least, it shouldn't blow up and give me an error, right? At the very least, it shouldn't blow up and give me an error, and it should give me, ideally, zero for the amount. So I'm going to save this. That tells me the cost is zero and the bake time is zero, which is correct. And again, that's an extreme situation, right, that, that there's no pieces. But you never know how people using your application is going to use it. Someone could take in just the customer information and click, you know, finish order, hit the wrong button, you know, or whatever. Well, you don't want to have your application blow up. It should handle it correctly. So you'll spend some time testing the unusual error conditions and make sure that your code is right. Now, let's look at, and some of this is judgment, but what constructor would you add on order, on the order? We have an array list of pizzas as one attribute. We have a customer that's only a string and another attribute. And finally, we have a Boolean for is delivery. What constructors do you think would be appropriate for this? Could I default the customer name? Okay, better question. Should I default the customer name? Unless there's one guy that like does like most of the ordering of the pizzas, you know, you probably wouldn't want to. Yes, you could, but you probably wouldn't want to. Could I default what pizzas are going to be ordered? Probably not either. Could I default the delivery charge? Or the, the delivery, yes or no? Yeah. All right. Maybe our pizza, you know, they're, they're, you know, I've been, uh, you know, I've been to some pizza places that are mainly a sit-down restaurant, but yeah, you can get a pizza to go if you want to. And I've been to other pizza places that the pizza places are tiny like this, and there's one table there, but most of the people that call in are calling in for delivery. So I should, I might be able to default that. So what constructors do you think I should have for this? Would it make sense to have an order without a customer name? No. So I want to make sure that gets set. All right? So I want to set the customer name. So I'm not going to have, I'm not going to have a no argument constructor, because I can't default it, and I don't want an order to be created without a name. So I want to set the customer name. I can't really do anything with pizzas, so I'm going to leave them out of the constructor business. And I could either set the delivery based on an argument, or I could default it because I know something about my business. Let's say my business is mainly a carryout place. All right? I would then make two constructors. Give it two arguments. And then say set. I cheated and didn't make my set method, so I'll just say customer equals arg name.
is delivery equals arg delivery. Then I could make one that only accepted the name and defaulted the delivery to whatever made sense for our particular organization. I think I said we do more deliveries than, um, than pickups or, or whatever. So I could set that to true. Actually, what I said before about the size of the pizza place makes no sense. I, you know, because uh, that, that would deal with dine-in or pick up delivery. It doesn't have to do with delivery or not, but anyhow, you get the idea. If I knew something about the kind of business the pizza place did, I could decide how to default delivery. Now, my code isn't going to work anymore because I have to go in and I will make this one last change. I no longer have the no argument constructor, right? Because I created a constructor of my own, so I can't use the no argument constructor. So I will go save that. I don't want to I just don't want to post code that has an error in it. All right, there we go. We're back to working. All right. Um, okay. Uh, we'll do the other things that I intended to do today on Monday, and we'll see you up in lab.